After dealing with gases, solids, and liquids in the past few chapters, we're going to go back to mixtures. This is a topic that we started in Chapter 4, when we talked about various solutions. Now generally, when we think of solutions, we think of things dissolved in water, but solutions are homogeneous mixtures that can happen between any phases of matter. You can have gases dissolved in gases, like air. You could have solids dissolved in solids, and gases dissolved in liquids. All of these homogeneous mixtures are examples of solutions. But as we did in chapter 4, most of the solutions that we're going to deal with are aqueous. When considering solutions, it's important to talk about how we measure their concentrations. How much solute is present in a certain amount of solvent. We've been using molarity a lot this year. This is probably the most common way to measure solution in this course. As a reminder, molarity is simply just taking the moles of the solute and divided by the liters of the total solution. I hesitate to mention molality. Molality is another way of measuring concentration. It's a little bit different than molarity. You still take moles of solute, that's why there's the word mole and molality, but instead of dividing it by liters of solution, we're going to divide it by kilograms of solvent. So two differences here. We're not dividing by liters, we're dividing by kilograms. And we're not dividing by the total amount of solution, we're just dividing by the kilograms of the solvent. Now I hesitate to talk about molality because molality is used when measuring things referred to as colligative properties. Things like boiling point, elevation, freezing point, depression, osmotic pressure. Molality comes in handy in a lot of those calculations. However, none of those concepts appear on the AP exam and therefore molality doesn't appear on the exam as well. I do want to highlight it though there is one part of a question in the homework that refers to molality. So I did want to take a second to show you the equation, but we're not going to dwell on it. We have also done mass percent calculations, and we use mass percent calculations to find things like empirical and molecular formula. These are pretty simple. You just don't want to fall into a trap. So for example, if you put 15 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of water, if we want to find the mass percent of sodium chloride, you might be tempted to say that it's 15%, but it's not. When looking to find percent by mass, you have to do the mass of what you're looking for. So in this case, the sodium chloride is 15 grams, but you don't divide it by the mass of the other thing. You divide it by the total mass. So my total mass is 115 grams. Turn it into a percentage. And in this case, you get a percent by mass of sodium chloride of 13%, not 15%. Just as you can do concentration measurements by mass, you can also do them by volume. The calculations for volume percent or percent by volume are the exact same calculations that you would do by mass percent. The difference is you're using units of volume instead of units of mass. When dealing with gases, we also measured concentration with mole fraction. That was that Greek letter chi that we saw earlier. We did this when we were doing partial pressures and using Avogadro's law to find the partial pressure of gases related to the mole fraction of the gases present in the sample. As a refresher, we calculate mole fraction in a similar way that we calculate percent by mass, but we have to do everything in moles. So given 12.7 grams of sodium chloride and 21.9 grams of lithium fluoride, and I dissolve them in 260 grams of water, let's find the mole fraction of lithium fluoride in the solution. The first thing we do is convert everything to moles. I have 12.7 grams of sodium chloride, and that converts to 0.217 moles of NaCl. I have 21.9 grams of lithium fluoride, that converts to 0 0.844 moles of lithium fluoride. And then I have 260 grams of water, and that converts to 14.4 moles of water. So if we're gonna find the mole fraction, we're gonna take our moles of what we're looking for. I'm looking for the mole fraction of lithium fluoride. So I'm gonna take the moles of lithium fluoride, 0 0.844 moles, and I'm going to divide by the total number of moles of all three of those together, which is 15.5 moles. When I do that calculation, I get a mole fraction of lithium fluoride equal to 0 0.545. And you leave it like that. It's not mole percentage, it's mole fraction. And there are no units to it because we're taking moles and dividing by moles. 
So again, that's a lowercase chi that we use as our symbol for mole fraction. We leave it as a decimal, it's not a percentage, and there are no units to the answer. I want to talk about one more unit of concentration, and again, I hesitate to talk about this, but it's in the reading, so I'll introduce it here quickly, and that's the measurement of normality. Normality is often used in acid-base neutralizations. I've seen it used in redox reactions as well, but usually in acid-base reactions. It shows the quantity of the reactive species in the reaction. So in an acid-base reaction, the quantity of the H plus in the acid, or the OH minus in the base. These are referred to as equivalents. So how many equivalents of H plus and how many equivalents of OH minus do you have? So in a one molar solution of HCl, you have one mole of the hydrogen ion for every liter. So a one molar solution of HCl would also be considered a one normal solution of HCl. The normality is one and the molarity is one. However, H2SO4 is diprotic. So you actually get two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of sulfuric acid. So though the concentration of the sulfuric acid might be two molar, it's actually four normal. A molarity of two for H2SO4 gives you a normality of four. The same thing happens with bases. NaOH, for every one NaOH, you get one equivalent of OH. So a 2.5 molar solution of NaOH would also be a 2.5 normal solution of NaOH. The normality and the molarity are the same. But for calcium hydroxide, you have two equivalents of hydroxide for every calcium hydroxide. So though the molarity is 0 0.05, the normality would be 0.1. Final concept that I want to talk about in this video, and that is the energy changes or the enthalpy changes associated with the dissolving process. These are referred to as heats of solution. Again, we're going to focus on dissolving things in water here. Now we've talked about the dissolving process. It's a three-step process. You have to separate the solute from each other which means you have to put energy into the solute to separate out those particles. You have to space out the solvent, so you have to separate the solvent from each other so that the solute can fit in between. So you have to put energy into the solvent. So both of those processes are endothermic. And then the solute and the solvent will attract each other. And that will be an exothermic process. The overall dissolving process, however, can be endothermic or exothermic, depending on how those three steps balance out. If you're putting in more energy to separate the particles than is released when the particles attract, well then you have an endothermic dissolving process. You'll have a positive delta H of solution. However, if more energy is released when the particles attract each other than you had to put in to space them out, then you'll have an exothermic heat of solution, or a negative delta H.